Hi, Deb. Hi, Jerry. How are you today? I'm pretty good, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's weather's warming up and light in the end of the tunnel. Vaccinated? All good. All good. I agree. I'm feeling fantastic uh, here in Philly where it's always sunny. We're going to have a beautiful weekend. Looking <laughs> forward to it. And I'm so excited to do this next episode with you on vulvar and vaginal health at any age. It's not an old woman's condition. This starts early on. Hi, welcome to Love Me Vita podcast, the podcast to women for women. I'm Jerry DiPiano, women's healthcare advocate and founder of Fem Pharma. I'm joined by Dr. Deborah Saltman, physician, researcher, the thinker, and medical director. Thanks, Jerry. I'm really proud to be a part of Fem Pharma's commitment to keeping women healthy and safe and this series of podcasts. Together, we're providing solutions for women who care about living their best lives at any age. As trailblazers, we aim to break down the myths and provide the truths about everything women want and care about. Imagine that. We asked women what they want and we are about to deliver it. By the way, we hope to entertain you and that's no BS. Over the coming months, we'll be speaking with experts about topics that matter, mental and physical well-being, and what more could be done. We will push our experts to give you answers that are real. So send us your questions and here's to loving our lives. The purpose of this podcast is to help women learn how to look after and maintain vulvar and vaginal health, not just in perimenopause and menopause, but from puberty through menopause. Women who are menstruating may complain of vaginal and vulvar irritation for many reasons. Tampon use, wearing of sanitary pads, exposure to soaps, perfumes, or wearing those tight, restrictive thongs, other lingerie, and skinny pants. During perimenopause and menopause, we know that vaginal and vulvar tissue may become more irritated due to the decline in estrogen, so that becomes a little bit more obvious. But if you're a woman of any age, you should pay attention to the delicate skin of your vulva and vagina. Practicing good self-care of all your skin, especially your intimate skin, is so important to your overall health. I'm here with Dr. Deborah Saltman, medical director. And Hi, Jerry. Perhaps um, you would share with us a little bit about the, uh, the vagina and the tissue of the vagina, why it is so important that it remain intact and healthy. Sure, and, and I'm glad that you brought up the idea that the vagina and vulva, they're part of our general body and they're not just our reproductive organs. They are with us for life and for good reasons, because one, they give us pleasure, but two, they're just part of our body, like any part of our lips or mouth. And as such, they have a junction between the skin and the mucosa, just like in the face, there's a junction between the outside skin and the inside mucosa or inside skin of the mouth. And the same thing happens in our vulva and vagina. And you know, just like we can get a dry mouth or dry eyes, or dry nose, we can get a dry vulva and a dry vagina. The problem is, most of us don't recognize it when we're young, because it's hidden. But all of a sudden, we get our periods, and we start bleeding down there, and we start trying to put a tampon in, and it's really dry, and we have to help put it in, like in the beginning, at the end of our periods, when if we use tampons, or even if we use pads, they can rub the outside of the vulva and vagina. So we're starting to have to think about, what is the tissue there? And it's skin, and it's skin that matches mucosa. So the mucosa tissue is very, very vascular. It's got a lot of vessels in it, and it produces lubrication. Better at some times of the month, and worse at others. Different transitions moving from, from what I call the pre-reproductive phase and puberty to the post-reproductive phase, menopause. So there's changes that happen, and they happen on a monthly basis as well, depending on hormones. So these tissues plump up, 
and they get dry and they plump up and get dry. It's a cyclical thing and, and as women we know about cycles because we live our lives in cycles really. That, that we have to think about these delicate tissues from the start. And so in as much as there's lots of mums listening to the show and lots of old women and there should be lots of younger women listening as well to hear about how we maintain the health of our vulva and our vagina. I guess we should talk about what happens in puberty and perhaps there are a number of threats and maybe you and I can talk about some of them, what are the threats. You mentioned a few but perhaps, can you remember some of the threats that you had when you were young to your, your precious tissue? I think we mentioned some of the more obvious ones and I think it's, it's great to let our listeners know and appreciate that if you had had a dry eye, use the analogy of dry eyes, dry mouth, we do something to address that, right? Could have, those could you know, be problems that we are confronted with as a result of allergies or the use of certain medications, etc. And you wouldn't ignore that. You mm. would address that by using something, something relatively benign that wasn't hormonal, that wasn't necessarily a prescription product, but you certainly wouldn't ignore it. So going through puberty as a young girl, I can remember doing bubble baths. Mm. That's probably the worst thing that a young girl could do because the soap could irritate her vulva. And in fact, we know that clinically, young women, young girls, may experience more vulvovaginitis than we anticipate. So it's really important to think about well, what, what are the potential causes of that problem. Um, and so even young prepubescent girls, girls before they've had their menstrual periods, could be experiencing itching, burning, irritation. They may be masturbating and they may create irritation. They may be wearing undergarments that are irritating them. Maybe they're nylon undergarments. Maybe they're wearing tight pants. Maybe they're athletes and they're riding cycles or playing sports or swimming and sitting around in a warm, wet sweatsuit, which encourages the growth of bacteria. So we need to pay attention to these things. Unfortunately, the, it, the dryness is not necessarily only caused by those types of factors. So if a young girl is itching and it's extreme, it may be something like pinworms, God forbid, it's something like lice, or worse, it could be a sign of abuse. So you do need to pay close attention to the reasons for the itching, the burning, and the irritation. But young girls, even prepubescent girls, do experience these problems. And it's pretty hard to have a look. I remember as I was growing up, we were advised to take a mirror and have a look down there so you knew down there of course as everyone called it um, below the belt or whatever have a look and and see what everything looked like and I have to tell you I was surprised how the changes in puberty how my vulva changed and my vagina changed over puberty when the hair came about what that meant what I meant what's terms in shaving waxing all those issues that can change the whole health of the region down there when I talk to young women, I say, do you know where your sensitive tissue is? Do you, have you passed your finger around there and, and actually found what, where your clitoris extends and the sensitive tissue around your vulva? And I suppose that's why little girls quite often like to have a little play around that region because there's some sensitive tissue. And anywhere that's sensitive, it needs moisture. And then moisturise inside, moisturise the vagina and, and moisturise and lubricate when you become sexually active whether it's with a partner or with a toy or by yourself, you still need to make sure that you've got some moisture there. I mean, you mo your mouth gets dry, you moisturise that. So the message is, teach your daughters well, to pull a phrase from an old rock and roll band, but teach your daughters well because their vaginal and vulvar health may slowly go by. Uh, so what we, we want to be sure to remind them of is that the vagina is not a dirty place. It's self-cleaning. There is nothing wrong with doing an examination using a mirror to see if things look okay, if they're red, if they're itchy. They should know where their body parts are. If you're a mom who's squeamish and obviously want to maintain boundaries, encourage your daughter to do self-exploration because it may not feel comfortable for either the mom or the daughter to 
engage in an exploration together, it may be better to let your daughter know that it is okay and is safe for her to do this herself and to feel confident in her body. By the way, if you're using birth control, birth control and hormones can, you, can also be the bad actors in terms of the vaginal dryness and some of the pain, as, as can treatments for breast cancer or endometriosis and even infertility treatments, right? Or I should say fertility treatments for, um, for women who are experiencing periods of infertility may also cause vaginal dryness. Perhaps we can chat a little bit about that and, and what women in the reproductive, height of their reproductive years should be thinking about. Now, we moisturize our face from an early age. We taught that that's to happen. We taught not to use soaps on our face as well. Well, that's the same kind of tissue. We brush our teeth regularly, we look after our gums, we look after our bodies and our nutrition, so we need to start early and moisturise. One of the problems is leakage, because most of us don't want to run around with wet between our legs. And so it's pretty important to do something or use something where we don't leak. I mean, we have enough problems, we know, when your period's about to start and you're running off to the bathroom every so often, oh, is it started yet? Am I bleeding yet? You know, that kind of feeling. Well, you don't like that feeling to happen when you're trying to moisturise. So it's important to find something or a product that really is minimal product, minimal leakage, and you can use with safety. I mean, that's the most important thing. Well, that's why tampons, when, when we think about uh, what transformed women's reproductive lives, we think about two things that, that had a tremendous impact. And as simple as it seems, tampons really gave women freedom, right? So it was the freedom not to have to change pads all the time. It was the freedom to avoid the wetness, right, that resulted from, you know, the bleeding, the monthly bleeding uh, during their menstrual cycle. So tampons became um, part of the liberation of women. But uh, I thought I would uh, ask you about a fun fact or fallacy. And you can tell me whether this is fact or fallacy. I'll do my best. I'm not sure I can, but I'll do my best. Is it true? that ancient Egyptians made tampons out of papyrus. Ah, fact or fallacy? I think that's a fact. But the question is, did they write on them first or not? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> the next Was fact, I right? Was I fact, right? You are correct. Oh, good. Okay, maybe I can get testing me. <laughs> Try the next one. Next one. Hippocrates the father of medicine, wrote that ancient Greek women used to make tampons by wrapping bits of wood with lint. Yuck. Ooh. Oh, that can't be true. Oh, I can't imagine putting wood up myself. Oh, that's They must that's have false. had vaginal splinters because it is true. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, well, one out of two. I got one out of two right. That's no good. Okay. Is there another one? Last one. All right. I'll work Same on this topic. One. Okay. Tampons. Women still use sea sponges as tampons. Yep, oh, that's true. That's definitely true. You are correct. Yep, I've got two. Well, two out of three ain't bad, as Meatloaf would say, so that's why. Two out of three is not bad, bad. Deb. Pretty good. Second most important thing were birth control pills, right? Which gave women flexibility, flexibility to plan their families and so forth. So the convenience aspect of products that can address these problems is super important. No woman wants to walk around having to change her lingerie two or three times because she's moisturizing her vulva or vagina. Yeah. She doesn't want to have to lie in bed waiting an hour for something to work. It really has to provide an, another level of convenience for her that she can do as a basic regimen or routine every single day without compromising her quality of life. We haven't talked about sex, but obviously uh, when a woman is at the height of her reproductive um, age, she's you know, maybe having more intercourse than, uh, than at later times in life. And so at the, um, at the moment, what we want is to be ready, right? Yep. So we want that, that soft caress without compromise. And that means that you want, to, you want to feel healthy and you want to have your mucosal to be as intact as possible. So the vagina and vulva need to be smooth, they need to be supp it needs to be supple. And it's not because of your partner necessarily. It's really for you so that you can enjoy the experience of intercourse. 
So these types of products, if used regularly, moisturizers combined with personal lubricant slash moisturizer, because lubricants are very short acting. So in order to get the best possible outcome, if women are act sexually active and they're having frequent intercourse, maybe you're trying to conceive, you want to be sure that that tissue is intact so that it becomes pleasurable for you. Not necessarily just, it's not about your partner. This is about the woman. This is about her health, her vulva and mm -hmm. vaginal health. About looking after yourself. Because lots of women ring in and talk to us here at Fem Pharma about what they should do. Lots of women are saying, my gynecologist is retired because they've stayed with their gynecologist for their menopause transition. I don't have a new gynecologist or my gynecologist doesn't, isn't really interested in this kind of thing and I don't know who to talk to and I can't talk to my partner about it. But the important thing is you're your own best carer. And every woman should know that one size doesn't fit all. Each treatment or each particular thing you do is got to be tailored to your needs. And the first thing is prevention is better than cure. And that's the most important thing. And every woman has to develop her own regimen. Jerry, uh, you can hear my accent, and I've spent quite a lot of time in Europe, and I do like your days. I have to tell you, they are much more healthy than all this kind of recycled toilet paper that, you know, in COVID times is dripping off my hands. But nevertheless, you can overcome that with some moisturiser. So moisturiser, as you said, teach your daughters well, teach them well, and teach them about good vulva and vaginal care. And that's not just for mothers, that's for fathers as well because fathers should take an interest in the care of their daughters. Fathers have an important role in teaching their daughters how to care for themselves as well. This kind of care has to start early, before menstruating, before girls get so worried about bleeding, they need to know that their vagina and vulva are organs that need to be looked after. As you said before, it's insensitive to use anything with a scent, scented tampons, scented pads, scented soaps, scented perfumes, anything scented down there. You know, lots of women say, oh, look, I, I, I use this, this particular oil because the scent is good. Well, usually that's the case for an irritant. Usually the scent is a real irritant, and we have to be very careful about perfumes around the vulva and vagina. So it's a, that's an interesting point because we, you know, we see campaigns from companies that are out there, and they, they talk about using vaginal washes, using perfumes to scent their vaginas, to conceal vaginal odor. And there is a natural odor to the vagina. If it's fishy, maybe indicative of something different, but we shouldn't be perfuming our vaginas. The World Health Organization advises against douching or using washes, vaginal washes. They're a no-no. Same thing with soap. So we have to remove that mindset. And we have to, again, going back to teaching your daughters, the shame, the taboo, the quote unquote stinky vagina is really not a good way in which to approach this at any age. So we need to move away from these irritants because mm -hmm. that's exactly what they are. But you know, the other thing that comes up quite often in the discussion is moisturizer versus lubricant. And that's a confusion about this. Because a, a lubricant is about a lubrication for a sexual act. So the lubricant is for short-acting activity, like sex, which it'd be nice if it went all day and it didn't hurt, but it doesn't. And it does hurt if Not it doesn't. If it went on all day, it would hurt. hurt. <laughs> exactly. So this idea that using a lubricant as a moisturiser is, re is really problematic because um, lubricant's about the act of the actual act of sex the introduction of something into the vagina, which doesn't happen for a long period of time. Right. So the <laughs> lubricant's short acting, but our vaginas and vulvas are there all day. And they, they, they need a moisturizer, just like our face. Choose a moisturizer to look after your vulva and vaginal health over a lubricant. Lubricants are just too short acting. Now there is some bad news, is that vulval and vaginal dryness doesn't go away just like dry skin in our hands and our mouth and our eyes. It doesn't go away and it needs to be taken care of and it needs regular attention with moisturisers. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing because we have to look after our bodies just like we do with exercise and nutrition. We have to look after our moisturisation. So that it doesn't go away, that's a reminder
to keep on doing something. So when women ring me up and talk about it, I say, that's a reminder to you to keep on moisturizing. So with, with women who are in the reproductive age group cohort, and we think about vaginal insertive intercourse, maybe they're, if they don't have a partner but they're in the reproductive age group cohort, they may be using toys, and the same thing applies to toys. If you're applying a moisturizer, um, it will make things better, but the lubricant is really the short acting, and so the lubricant could be applied to your toy. By the way, you should check to be sure that whatever lubricant you're using, if you have a partner and you're having vaginal insertive intercourse, right, then you want to be sure that the lubricant is compatible with condoms. We know that for women who are having intercourse at any age, if it's not in a monogamous relationship, you want to consider using condoms, but you want to be sure that it, these products are compatible, these lubricants are compatible. Mm -hmm. That isn't true of every lubricant. They may say that it's safe to be used, but one should do a little bit more investigation. But we, we touched on perimenopause and menopause, and this is where um, at least the classic is to think that if your vagina and vulva are dry, it's because you're old, and that's not the case as we've just highlighted. But we know that because there is a decline of estrogen, that this is where you start to see the problem appear more often and more frequently, which goes back to dosing or or providing the right amount of material and the frequency with which we do moisturization. And that is something that women need to understand. This is not something that just starts at menopause. It begins early on, as we highlighted. It continues through the reproductive age. And then when you begin to enter perimenopause, which can be in your 30s, early 40s, so it's not an old woman's problem, but when you start to approach that period of your life, you, um, you may want to start thinking about how frequently you are using something to moisturize. And, and, and when you need a lubricant, you may want to combine products that are both personal lubricants and moisturizers. Now, you know, the thing is, I'm pleased you said a decrease in estrogen, Jerry, because there's a kind of confusion out there that we, do, we stop producing estrogen when we go through the menopause. That's not true. We've got these wonderful glands called the adrenal glands and they sit on top of the kidney and they produce estrogen. We have estrogen. Believe it or not, we have testosterone too. And men have estrogen and testosterone, both produced by the adrenal gland. We don't stop producing estrogen. We stop producing estrogen at the reproductive level. So the post-reproductive period is pretty important. We still have estrogen. So saying we need estrogen creams on our vulva and vagina to replace estrogen is erroneous. We just need to keep moisturizing. And if we'd done it the right way when we were young, and I wish I had, we would be in a better position in the post-reproductive period. The data reflects that. There have been a number of studies that have measured um, the use of moisturizers and lubricants versus some of the hormonal treatments for the same problem, for vulva and vaginal dryness. And if done properly with the right ingredients and with the right frequency, it may be equally as effective without some of the consequences of hormone replacement. And, and, and that is, you know, that has always been a panacea um, for a long period of time. I worked in multinational pharma. We developed products for women's health, which were largely hormone-based. And while they can ameliorate some of the symptoms of menopause for women, they are not the most benign ways in which to address menopausal symptoms. Vaginal moisturizers and lubricants can also work in tandem with whatever hormone replacement therapy a woman may elect. So it's not for every woman, and it may not be an option for every woman. So there are, a, there are a number of women that are probably listening to this, and they have also considered doing certain procedures. I, I hate to use the word rejuvenate, but I will use that word, um, that will rejuvenate their vaginal and vulvar tissue. And while it's not something that, that we necessarily object to, we're not going to either recommend it or, or reject, but what about moisturizing when you've had one of those procedures? Well, you know, Jerry, as I said, 
Procedures can change the look, like laser or labioplasty. They can change the look and make you feel that it looks better. But they don't address the issue of the dryness and the irritation. They, it's cosmetic. They can make it look better. Even if you have your eyes, eyes lifted or your face lift, you still have to moisturise. So we, um, we consider the use of moisturisers and, and combination moisturisers and lubricants in conjunction with whatever procedure. The, and, and gynecologists, dermatologists, and plastic surgeons have shared with us that while these procedures may work for some women, they don't work for all women. And to the point that you raised earlier, and in summary, the moisturizers and lubricants should be used with those procedures to get the best possible outcome. So if you do a, you know, a facial, you don't stop using your skin moisturizer, and neither should you stop using your vulva or vaginal moisturizer if you've elected to have a procedure that makes you feel more confident or that improves your, your quality of life. Um, and that is a woman's choice. But the moisturization is something that needs to be practiced as a routine. So we've, we've covered some of the transitions from prepubescent girls through the reproductive years. Um, and I believe the message comes through crystal clear. This is really about the woman, as <laughs> I just shared. It is about the woman. It's about taking care of your vulva and your vaginal health, starting early, teaching your daughters, um, removing the taboo. This is not an old woman's problem. This is something that we need to address each and every day from pre-puberty all the way through the menopausal years. If you had dry eyes, you would not refrain from using a product for your dry eye or your dry mouth or your dry skin. And this is more skin, but it is actually a natural barrier that is more uh, tender, if you will, and is certainly a, a barrier that you want to keep intact because if it breaks down, it can also allow certain microorganisms to enter in certain diseases, et cetera, not just sexually transmitted diseases, but other types of infections. So we really wanna make sure that those tissues are intact. So what are the key features that women ought to be looking at when they select a product for a vaginal moisturizer and, and personal lubricant? Well, the first thing is you want to make sure that the product is reliable, it does what it says, and it does no harm. They're the three important things, like any product. So reliable means that it's been tested and it does what it says it does. And the FDA is pretty good at making sure that that happens if you want your product checked by the FDA. And if you get your product checked by the FDA and it's cleared, you know they're going to tell you it's reliable. The second thing is how long it lasts, the shelf life of it, and that's also on cleared products is tested and checked. And, and the final thing is consistency in manufacturing. One of the things I've been noticing now with uh, product lines is there's always there's a change in consistency when different people say they're making the same thing. So consistency in manufacturing is important. And lots of these over-the-counter products or compounding chemist products, there's no consistency in the manufacture. The product can change from bottle to bottle uh, just as your cup of coffee can change. So it's pretty important to go with a product that's reliable and every time you use it, you know what you're getting. And I think that's, what's, that's what FDA looks for when it clears products. So I'm a, I'm a great believer in getting products that are cleared from the FDA, but also ma are made in laboratories and manufacturing plants that are certified that have good manufacturing practice. GMP, good manufacturing practice, and that's pretty important as well, so that you make sure the product's right. Well, it's more important for personal care products. We know that in personal care products, they're particularly if you're applying these to a mucosal surface uh, like the vulva or the vagina, you don't want to just use any product. So what you're sharing with us is it, particularly if you are selecting a personal lubricant, you should be tuned into whether that product has been cleared by the FDA. And when a consumer product uses words like treat 
that's inappropriate. When they make claims for conditions that the product is incapable of addressing in terms of symptom relief, that is impermissible. And that should be a red flag to women when they are making a decision about which product to select. For a vulvar and vaginal dryness makes the claim that it can cure overactive bladder or stop you from having bladder leakage, be careful because that is a big red flag. You see, quite often we get calls from women once they've got a problem and their vulva is red and raw and the vagina's red and then they, we've got a good product and they put a lot of it on and they say, it burnt me. Well, it's like any sore that you've got anywhere. It has to heal gradually. And you can go towards certain products that feel good. You know, when you put a Band-Aid over a sore, it feels better because the air doesn't get to it. But when you lift the Band-Aid off, the sore is all messy and wet and you need to expose it to the air. The same sort of thing about putting products like whatever plant oil on your vulva because it feels good, it's not doing any good. It's just covering up a problem. And it's much better to treat the problem than to cover it up. So rather than slathering it on some plant oil because it blocks the pain but doesn't treat the problem, it's not, it's not a very good idea. And I advise women, if you have problems and you've got to the level where you've got problems, please use cleared products and use them judiciously. Whatever problem you've got, and if it's really severe, and that's a really awful place to be in, it took a long time to get there, and it's going to take us some time to ameliorate. So our vaginas and vulvas are not meant to be treated with salad dressing. So when we talk about putting plant oils, be careful, because those may increase um, the incidence for some of the urogenital infections, ur urinary tract infections, there's good data in the literature that demonstrates that. And we also say that your vagina is not a pina colada. Yeah. So it's become very popular to use things like fruits, coconut, etc. Your vagina is not a pina colada, so even though it feels like it's natural and less harmful, you don't know how those products were actually made, where they were made, how they were extracted. And when people say, well, this is a natural product, it's a plant-based product, where was the plant grown? What, what was the extraction method that was used? Did they use certain chemicals that are carcinogenic to extract that? These are the sorts of things that women need to be concerned about because again you're placing this on a mucosal surface which is even more tender and provides more of an opportunity for infection to be transmitted and oh by the way there is a route of transmission from the vagina into the rest of the body because we know that the, the vagina is very very vascular which means that there are lots of blood vessels there which provide an opportunity for things to move from the vagina into what we call systemic circulation, which is to say that it moves throughout the circulatory system of the body. First going from the vagina into your pelvic and reproductive organs, and then being transported to other parts of your body. This is why the volume of material that you use also makes a difference. Less is always more. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important also to remember that most oils are, are inert. They, have, they are not acidic and they're not alkaline. They, you know, they're, they're, neither, they're neither like a vinegar or like a milk, most of them. But our vagina functions best if it's in an acid environment. It's funny that, isn't it? Our vagina likes to be acidic and we don't get thrush or candida when we're acidic. So it's, it's hard to imagine because on the skin, we don't. if we've got a cut or something, the acid goes in there. But the vagina says, I'm much happier. I'm much happier. And that's why lots of pro natural products have been there to treat candida like lactobacillus. Lactobacillus pulls lactic acid. So the idea is to keep the acid level of the vagina safe. And most oils are inert. They don't do that. Well, Deb, as always, this conversation has been enlightening, even for the two of us who spend yep. every single day 
looking after different types of products, opportunities, and ways in which we can enrich the lives of women. Absolutely. Thank you for joining me today for Love Mia Vita. And Absolutely, Jerry. Uh, and good luck to all the women out there listening. And we look forward to seeing you at our, on our site or linking into our Facebook page or listening for the next podcast because we've got some more really exciting things to talk with you about. Check out www.fempharma.com. <laughs>